release Oops. I'm sorry, recording <laughs> is the release of Forgotten Toys. Uh, I know you're pretty excited about that. I'm very excited about it. It's my first uh, solo EP here, and uh, it's become, been a long time coming. These pieces have been rattling around in my brain and in my uh, uh, treasure chest in the studio, and uh, just waiting to come out and be repurposed and rediscovered. You know, so uh, this is uh, another side of me, and uh, I hope people like it. I'm sure they will. I, I absolutely love it. Could you talk a little bit about when you started the process of bringing forgotten toys together? Yeah, um, I had pieces lying around. I had a piece uh, called Lucy, which is kind of a jazzy piece that I wrote with uh, Mike Lang. That was about seven or eight years ago. And uh, we were going to do a duet project here and it never came to fruition because he was busy. I was busy. And uh, so I just decided uh, uh, it was lying there. So I decided to put it on my solo record because I think it's indicative of, uh, of me and way, the way I hear jazz mm -hmm. and uh, how I like it to be played. Um, uh, the rest of it probably came to year, gear, uh, together in the last two years during the pandemic, I think, when everybody had a little bit more time mm -hmm. and was staying indoors. Uh, we all got pet projects to do. And, uh, my friends and bandmates, uh, Steve Lukather and Joseph Williams, were both making solo records. So they nudged me and, and kind of urged me on to uh, uh, try to do a solo record during this time. And I'm very glad I did. It was a magical experience. Oh, absolutely. So s since you mentioned uh, Lucy, and I'm very sorry to hear about the passing of uh, Mike Lang. Yeah. Um, that composition, uh, that you did with him could have easily had been the cornerstone of a jazz album for you. Yeah. Uh, but instead you have a combination of styles here. Um, did you have any intent of doing so, a combination of styles? Cause some, uh, some of the songs could easily fit in a total album. Some could be a solo right. album, mm -hmm. some could be a jazz album. Yeah. I wanted it to be diverse and interesting and with no filler tracks. And the way I like albums, I like to be surprised a little bit, mm -hmm. but I like to still groove. I like to have the grooves going all the time. So uh, 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 I think that uh, this is about seven cuts is about a nice little time period, about 30 minutes where someone can listen to without wanting to take the needle off and put something else on right there. So uh, it was uh, uh, customized to be just diverse. Oh, absolutely. It really is. And it's, a beautiful snapshot of of compositions and players. Uh, did you have any thought of doing this project the way you and Toto had done all in one in terms of uh, piecing different parts together from different eras of the band? Because uh, some of these songs date back quite some time, correct? Well, uh, only one of the songs goes back uh, to about uh, 206 okay. when we were doing the Falling In Between. I had started right the day after we finished that album. I started playing the riff for uh, All the Tears That Shine. But I didn't get to writing it until about four years ago with Michael Sherwood. And uh, uh, then it all came. I overdubbed it and put all, put a whole new track to the, the, the guide vocal that he did, which ended up being a master vocal for my album here. And uh, so I just overdubbed the rest of the pieces in the last few years here. And uh, I think it's... Uh, real uh, a great performance by him vocally you know and i we kind of are honoring his passing uh by uh, put, putting on the album yeah i think i i talked to mike uh twice right before the release of toto 14 uh -huh. and i also talked to him um when steve picaro released his solo album and that was all the tears of shine was one of the songs which I found extremely moving. And we talked about how he worked on that with you. Yeah. Um, and also we talked a little bit about a song I'm going to talk about later, which is Chinatown. So it was, I, when I, when I heard the album and saw his name there and also Billy Sherwood being involved in terms of the backing vocals, I yeah. was, I was shocked. And when I heard the track, I was blown away. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, so the songs have been songs are relatively new for you uh, in terms of the recording process. Joseph Williams played a pivotal role, very similar to the role he played in um, Old Is New. Uh, how did Joseph get involved? 
Joseph and I have had a writing chemistry for a while here now. And uh, uh, him and I just started to, to co-collaborate on other songs for Toto. And, uh, and then I saw how he would uh, kind of co-produce uh, the engineering side of Toto and working that way with him hands-on as an engineer. He's an excellent engineer, as well as a vocalist and vocal arranger. And he is, uh, uh, has it all. And so I decided that I wanted to, uh, uh, to remain uh, an artist somewhat on my own album so I could have someone objectively listen to me in the booth, as they say, to what, what they think. And I value his opinion very much. And so between his engineering skills and his uh, uh, writing talent and singing talent, it seemed like a good fit. I see. And I, I imagine that you have produced, and I, I didn't look up, maybe I should have, but you have produced hundreds of records yourself. I mean, I think about Cheryl Lynn's record. I think about the record that Billy Sherwood and Michael Sherwood, um, the band they were in, and you and Logic, Steve Carroll produced. Logic. Logic, thank you. Uh, and... Uh, I think you also did one of my favorite boss gags albums dig with dig. Ray Parker jr. Oh yeah. Um, how has production changed since you were doing it to what Joseph is doing now? Um, well, the technology has changed a, a, a whole lot uh, back in the day where we used to cut tape, have two inch tape and have to splice edits together. Now it's the push of a button on a computer with a program like logic or pro tools. So a lot of it has sped up and made it easier uh, to manage uh, stuff. Of course, there's a lot of freedom uh, uh, in it, so you can get lost to some people in having too many tracks available. Uh, we only had like 16 and 24 tracks back in the day, and so it limited your decisions. And uh, uh, but I think it's a mar they're marvelous tools because you can actually make an album on a laptop now and it can be excellent sounding. So uh, technology has made it easier for all of us, all the people that are, are gifted out there that never thought they could uh, uh, have a voice mm -hmm. uh, can make a, a, a footprint uh, with their uh, computers now, you know? Yeah, sonically this album, it sounds warm. It sounds wonderful. It could have been back in the heyday, recorded back in the heyday of the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is fantastic. And also, you bring together a group of musicians, some of which I was familiar with you working with before, and some of which I didn't think you worked with before, um, such as, I mean... I, I wasn't expecting to see Brian Eno's name on, on your record. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, I, I think Davy Johnston wrote, worked on uh, the Toto album um, Behind the Looking Glass. I'm not sure about that. I think he did back uh -huh. in the uh -huh. and, I think so. Course, I think you're right. I have good memory right there. On, and did he uh, have, yeah. yeah. That was the album right there. Yeah. And you also have some Toto. Um, some total legends such as, such as uh the great lenny castro and of course steve lucather and joseph williams yeah. um yeah. when you went into the studio did you have certain songs cast for certain players and singers yeah we uh when we put together our kind of our, our blueprints and our demos to before we uh, let put musicians on there actually joseph and i sat and cast it cast each song there and we're pretty good we know all the players because they're, we've played with them and they've been our friends. All these guys are friends of ours for 25 years plus. So we have a lot of shorthand that's real easy. And uh, we were, we're very confident in the, in the players that we would get for each song, you know, as far as combinations. It was kind of fun casting because you could, there's so many good players and it's the, trying to get the magical combination together. That's the trick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I bet. So, you could pull out certain Toto songs and make certain types of compilations from those songs. For for example, um, Great Expectations could be on a prog, could be the, the linchpin yeah. for a prog rock album. Yeah. The song, the first song on the album, uh, Forward, has a prog rock, Rick Wakeman, 
um, Tony Banks feel? What was uh, the impetus behind Forward? The Forward, I wanted to show a, a cinematic side there and that I'm a big uh, follower of, of uh, film composers. Uh, my great friend, James Newton Howard, mm -hmm. and not to mention Jerry Goldsmith, who I had the honor to work with, and John Williams, who I've also worked with. And I just wanted to uh, uh, just give a little tiny teaser there and just say, this is a part of me, this is a, a side of me that someday we'll uh, explore a little more, but not on this album, you know? <laughs> so I got, I just, that's why it's only 20 seconds long. And it goes into will i belong to you now that's that's a great point because it's 20 seconds long and it catches the listener and you're thinking okay i'm waiting for the next song i'm waiting I know. for the song while you want this to go on yeah. and yeah. then you hit the listener with the joseph uh the song you co-wrote with joseph williams will i belong to you could you talk about that a little bit yeah we had joseph had a chorus and it was just i just was going through old tapes of ours uh, on the computer and uh, that had been digitized. And uh, I heard this chorus that he had. It was just a little piece of a chorus, which is the chorus that's on the song uh, the, the first time right there. And I said, man, I really like to write a part to that, a verse to that. So I got busy and wrote uh, a, a verse and, uh, they, and we connected the verse, the chorus with jo Joseph Help with the transitional music. And uh, uh, we did the work on the lyrics together and it was a great uh, collaboration. And I think it turned out really well. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have the, the great players on it, the fantastic uh, Dean Parks, and of course, Steve Lukather on guitar, um, Nathan Ease and Gray Bissonette, who's with Ringo's band. And yeah. I think he did some filling in for Simon Phillips with Toto. He did. Um, and then you handle the piano and organ. Um, were they, uh, those were patches? Uh, yes, yes, they were. Uh, I prefer, I have a Hammond organ and I have a grand piano right here. So we always test it out on the acoustic guys first. And then, but sometimes in the rec recording business, some of these processed uh, uh, virtual instruments have great sounds mm -hmm. and uh, we prefer them to the way we're making records because they're a little bit from, uh, you know, uh, old school. And so uh, it sounds, sometimes it's just the sound, we just use our uh, uh, emotional response uh, vis viscerally and uh, uh, to just either say a sounds good or sounds bad, you know, mm -hmm. but a lot of those, but then I have, that's why we brought in the real players here. That's why we have Greg Bissonette on drums playing. That's why we have Nathan East playing. That's why you have a Dean Parks and a Steve Lukather. Give it that, you got to have that, you got to put the human aspect in there sure know? and, and Mo, you wouldn't know i mean that's just a question because you wouldn't know whether it was a patch or the actual b3 or a steinway so but it, it really works um let's talk about the next song which is first time which is also another co-write uh, i think joseph williams helped out in the lyrics there yes, talk right. about that a little bit yeah yeah, you've really done your homework, by the way. You're pulling these things out. This is fantastic, I just want to tell you. Uh, Joseph, I wrote, had a song, I had a riff for a song. And uh, that's the riff is, you can actually hear the part of the demo, which is the first four bars, is actually the demo riff. And then we added the players on in the production. But uh, I had this riff and then I, I wrote a chorus and then a bridge to it. And I, I had the uh, chorus written and uh, uh, then Joseph came in and heard it and says, you, that's the first one we should start with right there. And he helped uh, construct the form on it with me and kind of arrange it for me. And he put the uh, blueprint together of the demo this, that sounded amazing. And then we just started casting people like Lenny Castro and uh, uh, Dean Parks mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, uh, players like that, you know, uh, Nathan East and stuff. So uh, uh, that's how that got put together. And then Elizabeth Page, uh, your yeah. daughter, provides backing vocals. She does, because this song is about uh, a father and a daughter's coming of age mm. and uh, watching my daughter grow up and wishing the best for her and hoping that she finds, like I did with my wife, true romance 
and love and stuff. And it's kind of from a father's point of view. So uh, uh, she, without asking my permission, snuck in the studio, had my engineer throw up the mic and she threw on that part and surprised me. And she really surprised me because I usually wasn't used to her being in the studio working on my stuff, mm -hmm. you know? So it caught me by surprise. But then I, then I, I, I got, my heart got full when I heard the part and it just, uh, she did just some answers. So it's, uh, it's a real father-daughter uh, uh, reunion right there. And it works really well. Yeah, thank um, you. Glad you like it. I, I skipped Spirit of the Moonlight, and it's not a slight to the song because it's a great rock song. It's a great okay. single. Uh, how did that come about? That came about, again, I had a piece to the chorus. I had the instrumental part, not the vocal, but the, the instrumental part of the chorus. And uh, then I came up with uh, the other verse part, writing it, and, but Joseph helped me put the form together because I had these pieces of the chorus and the verse and then the intro section. And it was like, well, how much of what section do we put there? Which is how form, when you construct the form of a song. So we got that together and I got a melody on top of it. And Joseph and I, I had a little reoccurring dream I had a couple of times about a girl riding a painted horse. And that's about as much as I had and Joe uh, jumped into it with both feet uh, for the narrative. And uh, after uh, him and I, we go back and forth on, on lines and stuff. And I would write a line, he would write a line till it got finished. And uh, uh, Steve Lukather put fantastic guitar fills and guitar solo. I think it's one of his best. And I invited an old friend, Mike McDonald, to yes. come sing on it. And he sings on the choruses with me. And he also sings on some fills at the very end, which uh, are just sensational. And uh, I really makes it for me. Yeah, his vocal contributions remind me a lot of what he did on Total 14, actually. Yeah. The, the, I think he did three songs or maybe two or three songs on that album. It, it works. It's not overwhelming at all. Um, yeah. and, and one thing that I've said in the past is that the best Toto ballad singer in my mind, was Steve Lukather. Is Steve Absolutely, Lukather. hands hands down. But you have such a strong rock voice, and there was a period in time in Toto when you you didn't sing more than one vocal on an album. Right. But it's just great to hear you have a, a chance to provide that kind of rock voice. And then on a Queen Charade, which is more bluesy and just as hard rocking, you do a great vocal there as well. Talk about that song. Um, that's one of my favorite songs because it's a little more cavalier and reckless. And uh, I've always been a song, uh, a fan of uh, uh, the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. and uh, they've had. Uh, I'm not afraid to admit that they've had a huge influence on my life. So, uh, for about four years ago, I got a chance to work on Keith Richards' solo record. Uh, Steve Jordan, the current drummer with the Rolling Stones, uh, did call me to come and play on his record. And uh, uh, I got to meet Keith and uh, he had his arm around me while we were listening to his album back. And he's just such a great cat and, and so talented as a writer. Uh, that inspired me to write this song uh, that I uh, uh, put a, a little blueprint on uh, with piano and bass and drums. And then I sent it to Steve Jordan and uh, I brought in Don Felder, uh, uh, Eagles man, uh, who wrote Hotel California to play slide guitar because he's uh, got such a signature style. And uh, uh, that's about it. Yeah, Warren Ham also on a harmonica. That's um, right. I think he did the harmonica on No Love when you guys were doing that live. That's right. That's and of course, right. saxophone now. Uh, right. Don Felder on slide. And you did Don Felder's second solo album and his third album. You and I see yes. Keith Picard were involved with those. Yeah. And this is great to hear Felder play slide. Um, that really works extremely well. And what we've talked about all the tears that shine and Mike, Mike Sherwood already. Uh, and how did you get Billy Sherwood to, to contribute? I'm, I'm surprised he had the time. He's been so busy yeah. with so many pro projects. You know, I just heard, I, I wanted to, uh, Ask him if he heard any backgrounds on it. He said he just said he'd love to uh, sing something on the end like that. So uh, he put in those kind of Beach Boys kind of backgrounds mm -hmm. in the very last chorus, and then he does a couple fills at the very end. And I thought it was very moving and uh, and 
just am passionate that uh, his brother, Mike's brother, would be on uh, a, a song that Mike had sung and that had Mike had co-written. I thought it really brought the, the family together on that one, you know? Absolutely. I, I talked to him a few times because I'm a huge Yes fan. In fact, I saw you and Yes the first time Billy toured with them a few oh, yeah. times on a tour. Sure. Um, and one thing I asked him about was the song, The Other Side, which you, had, you wrote with him for Kingdom of Desire. That's right. Do, do That's you recall right. the song? I do. I do. And that was another, that was my first time, I think, writing with Billy on that one there. And another guy named, uh, uh, I can't remember his name right now, but I will. I don't and uh, uh, it's funny, we, uh, the other side, we went to Nashville uh, to pick up an award and the uh, 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 Rascal Flats invited us to their restaurant which was empty at the time because they owned the restaurant. So they just had a private dinner and they brought their guitar. And the first thing they did was sing the other side for us, a cappella. And it was just, it was unbelievable. It sounded like a, a country, a country smash, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, that's uh, was one of those uh, sleeper kind of songs and kind of had a nice vibe to it, which is why we put it on the record. Yeah. That was an absolutely beautiful song and an album full of really hard rock songs. Yeah. Uh, that's, fantastic and i think it's also the song which featured the keyboard uh, pedal steel by cj uh vanston yeah which cj that's yeah. him doing those keeps on a keyboard he's, he's yeah. he does a really good imitation i was really jealous of that one <laughs> <laughs> um so the last song we talked about lucy a little bit and you feature james torme how did you get him involved um, I'd met James back on the Falling in Between album, and uh, I had known his father when I was a kid because my father, Marty Page, who was a jazz arranger, arranged a bunch of several albums with uh, Mel Torme. So they were uh, they were a pair together. They were uh, collaborators. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought on this jazz song right here, I thought I'd worked with James before and he was pretty good scatter. So I thought I'd bring him in on the background kind of uh, pay homage to our uh, fathers, uh, Marty and Mel Torme. And uh, uh, I thought he did a pretty good job on there, doing some oohs and ahs, and then doing a little bit of uh, vibe scatting there at the very, very end. So, uh, uh, but that was, uh, my dad was a jazz pianist, so this, well, that's why that influenced me to do something jazz, of a jazz nature there. And uh, I'm really happy I put it on the record. Yeah, absolutely. Um... That really just makes me want for the looking forward to the next David Pace <laughs> album. <laughs> um, if I could shift gears and ask you a few non-Toto and Toto questions, if it's okay. okay. Um, so you did the string arrangements and horn arrangements for the best Juby Brothers album ever, "Living on the Fault Line." Do you recall that? I do. "Living on the Fault Line." I, I do recall doing that. How did you get involved with that? That was pretty early in your, um, well, maybe it was not early in your career. I think Ted Templeman, the producer, had heard some arrangements I had done, possibly the Silk Degrees album, but uh, uh, he had heard some stuff that I'd done and asked me if I did strings and horns, and I said yes, because uh, I knew that uh, uh, me and my father were co-writing arrangements at the time, mm -hmm. so uh, it was a really good combination of, uh, of collaboration on that, so... Uh, uh, my father helped me on that album there, and I'm glad because it just brought this uh, classy, professional uh, string writing and horns writing to, from, from the both of us and, and our, the way our, our sensibilities, we, we see eye to eye on most uh, music notes that are put down. So I'm glad that you uh, 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 brought that up. Yeah, absolutely a favorite. I want to ask you about a few Toto songs and one of my friends and a guy who listens to my podcast would be really mad if I didn't ask about this song so I'm going to ask about it uh from isolation strangers in town how did that come about that was a co-write between you and Jeff stranger in town came about uh I wanted to write a song uh like John Lennon had done with a newspaper so I was leaving London to come back to LA and I had forgotten my passport at the hotel. 
So I had to go back to the hotel and miss the flight and got rerouted to uh, uh, Seattle. So while I was on the plane, I took the newspaper from the stewardess and I just circled all these headlines that were in the newspaper on all the various sections and kind of put them together on a tablet and uh, then constructed a, a, a narrative on it. And, uh, and then I came up with the riff, which is the kind of a creepy, spooky riff uh, for a stranger in town kind of thing. And uh, that's how it's happened. And I brought it to the band. A wonderful song. And I got to see you perform that live a few times as well. So that's great. The next one is Drag Him to the Roof from Tambu. Yeah, that was kind of a period where that was a rough period for me because my father was uh, fairly sick. And uh, so I can't give you too much information. I know I wanted to do uh, something, uh, a ska kind of uh, tune on it. So I think that just once it got going, it kind of propelled itself. Okay, thank you for that. Then um, going into the future, I guess, Toto 14, Chinatown. Chinatown. Chinatown, uh, uh, the impetus for that was uh, my, I have a cousin and uh, lots of cousins that live up in Oakland, California. And uh, we used to go hang out, uh, three guys, and we used to go over to, to uh, San Francisco and hang out like in places like Chinatown and down where Boss's Club is and stuff like that. And it's kind of, uh, I got drawn in by the mystery of the, of, the, of the gangs that used to be there and that are still there. And the kind of the underground, the murky underbelly of San Francisco as far as Chinatown goes. So uh, I thought it was interesting. And uh, I wrote it back, uh, probably back in 78, the song, and I had a verse and chorus, but I just never finished the verse. I got uh, uh, up against the wall with it, and uh, Mike Sherwood came in and uh, unstuck me, as I say. Wonderful. Then we'll go to the Isolation album and talk about Carmen, the first track on the album. Carmen. Carmen, uh, that was a suggestion from my uh, wife's mother, because uh, she was an opera singer. And she said, you should do something from Carmen. You should do, turn that into some kind of song. So I liked it and I listened to it. I listened to, uh, to it and I started writing down the scenario, the narrative on it. But I wanted to, um, I honestly uh, had heard, just heard uh, the day we finished uh, the Toto 4 album, I heard Shock the Monkey by Peter Gabriel. And it made me feel a certain way. And I wanted to get this rolling bass happening. So I kind of uh, did my version of, uh, of, of how Shock the Monkey feels, but I put the narrative of Carmen on top of it. Wow. And uh, then uh, the rest is just me trying to give it its own life, you know? Yeah, that's a great song. And um, Toto 14, Great Expectations. Oh, Great Expectations. Again, that was some pieces that I had had I had the intro, Great Expectations, since the Turn Back album. But the material that came uh, wasn't just right, that came after it. So I was in uh, Europe at the time with my wife, and I started hearing a song and pieces of, uh, uh, so pieces of music in my head. And I got my wife's uh, cell phone, and I started singing them into them. The intro, uh, the verse, the chorus, and everything like that. The only thing I didn't have was the guitar solo section, which was Steve Lukather's contribution. But I had that and I had the ending and then Joseph came in and we wrote the lyrics together. And uh, uh, it was, uh, we wanted to do it a long extended work uh, as our heroes, uh, yes, mm -hmm. used to do and everything. We wanted to do something to perform it live in concert, which we did. It was really challenging to perform that live, but we did it. And uh, uh, that's uh, how that song came about. Yeah, that's a wonderful song. And you have such a wonderful, rich musical history. Uh, I could not be happier for this album. I can't wait for the next one. David, is there anything else you want to add? No, I just want to say, I want to uh, thank our fans out there and tell them how grateful we are and I am for their loyal support all these years. And nothing means more to Toto than your, the love and support of all of our fans that have stayed with us 
So uh, thank you very much and I'll bless you all. Thank you very much, David. Take care. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it. Bye. Bye.